and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Remember Acts chapter 1, they said he's going to come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. He went up to heaven visibly. He went up to heaven in the clouds. Verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. There are folks who've twisted that scripture to say, no, it's every saved eye. It didn't say that. It said, every eye shall see him. And God's word is very clear about this, that the whole world will see. The, the world will go dark, and then the heavens will open. The world will see Jesus Christ coming. And those who've been murdering and martyring God's children will tremble with fear. They will wail because of Jesus Christ coming. Now, in a few years, they won't be wailing. In a few years, they'll be rebelling even harder, blaspheming God, angry at God for his wrath being poured out. But at this moment, when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, to, and we meet him in the air, every eye is going to see him, he's going to come in the clouds. Notice, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. In fact, I missed a ver part of the verse. Let's read it again. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So, uh, Revelation 1, again, it's talking about the coming of the Lord, that he's going to come in the clouds, Every eye shall see him. With that in mind, let's go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And again, for some of you, if you just simply study your Bible, this isn't even a thing, and that's great. It's wonderful if you just see what the Bible plainly says. But for others, there are many books that have been put out that have twisted people's minds about prophecy, and what has been said about Revelation 4, 1 is that this is the rapture. I was sitting in Bible college, the first time I ever heard this. I, I had read through it. My dad, as I've told you, taught me to read literally from the Bible, read through the Bible a lot. And just in reading the Bible, never one time did I think Revelation 4.1 was the rapture. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think it's because I didn't have a doctorate degree in Bible studies? Do you think that's why? Or do, you, do you think it was because, you know, I hadn't been through my master's degree in college or, or, you know, I hadn't done a lot of deep study? No, I'd read the Bible many a time and not one time. Did I read Revelation 4.1 and go, that's the rapture? Um, folks, I'll tell you why. Because it's not the rapture. And did you know the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you? And if you'll read the Bible and just simply go to the Word of God, He'll teach you what God's Word says. Now, I'm going to tell you, you'll get all kinds of confused when you mix in book after book after book after book after book about the Bible instead of reading the Bible. And I know this is so simple. I know it is. But this is where we are in, a, in our culture in America. I, I, I mentioned before, I had a man come into the office. He was serious. And I wasn't, I wasn't being facetious. I wasn't joking with him. I was serious. He said to me, he said, what book can I read to really understand what the Baptists teach and preach? I said, brother, that book right there. He goes, no, no, I know that. I mean, I know that. But what book can I read? I'm not kidding. Read that book right there. Read the Bible. Folks, it, it, this is why we're confused, because we read book after book after book after book. Now, look, if you want to have some books, that's fine, but here's what I'd recommend. Read this one through about 25 times first. You read this one through about 25 times first, you get where you understand this book, where you're well-versed in the book, then feel free to maybe get a few other books to help supplement some things, maybe see a different way somebody said something. But what a lot of people want to do is they want to take a shortcut. They don't want to put in the study. They don't want to put in the time. So they just want to go to Dr. So-and-so, who has a whole bunch of letters after his name, and say, well, he must be smarter than I am. I mean, he is a doctor after all. You know, I, I like one old preacher I knew, he'd say, I'm not a doctor, I'm not even a nurse. That's what he'd say. I'm not even a nurse. You know, the fact is, let's forget all the doctorates, uh, the PhDs, the post hole diggers, okay, and let's instead just go to the book, go to the Bible. As I've said before, I, I've, been, I've been to Niagara Falls, I don't know, two or three times in my life. It's beautiful. Uh, I would rather go to Niagara Falls than talk to somebody who's been to Niagara Falls. I'd rather see it for myself. What we have a lot of people doing is instead of going to the Bible for themselves, they ha we have a lot of people going into another book that's about the book. Folks, we must be very careful. Just by reading the Bible, if you did not have these preconceived notions and ideas from prophecy study books, you would not come to Revelation 4.1 and go, well, this is the rapture. But here is a man who... I respect in certain things, especially when it comes to soul winning, but he's absolutely wrong 
when it comes to Revelation 4.1. And here's what he wrote. It's a book he has about Revelation. He wrote, and everybody in here, probably most of us would know who this is. He said, it is important to notice the effect of verses 1 through 3. Are you in Revelation 4, by the way? All right, let, let's just read Revelation 4, 1 through 3 together. It says, after this, this is John the Revelator, okay? John, the one God gave Revelation to. Remember when he penned down Revelation in Revelation 1, Jesus said, write the things, uh, write the things which thou hast seen. That's Revelation 1. Then he said, write the things which are. That's Revelation 2 and 3. Those are the churches, the literal, seven literal churches that he's writing to. And then he says, and write the things which shall be hereafter. By the way, those who teach Revelation 2 and 3 are about the history of the church. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said Revelation 4. He said, these are the things which shall be hereafter. He didn't say, go Revelation 2 and 3. Those are the things which shall be hereafter. They're actually a, a, a symbol of history to come. That's not what he said. He said from Revelation 4 forward, those are the things that are coming in the future. And remember in the future, that was still, we're, we're talking about uh, the first century, okay? We're talking about the first century up until our day, all of these things to come in the future. Look what he says, Revelation 4.1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So again, remember that from chapter 4 forward. Those are the things which must be hereafter. Verse 2, and immediately I was, what does it say? What are the next three words? Very important. I was what? In the Spirit. I was in the Spirit. That's very important. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight, like unto an emerald. Well, this brother in Christ, who, again, is a soul winner, preached great messages on the family, he pulled notes from Nelson, or from Darby and from the Plymouth Brethren and from Schofield, and here's what he wrote. It is important to notice the effect of verses 1 through 3 in setting the order of events concerning the second coming of Christ. These verses evidently picture the rapture. If they do not, don't miss this, if they do not, if these verses we just read do not picture the rapture, then there is not a single reference in the entire book of Revelation to the rapture of the saints. And that would be almost unthinkable, yeah, in a book, the theme of which is the revelation of Jesus Christ at his second coming. Well, yes, it would be unthinkable that he would write revelation, which is a revealing of the things to come, and not include the rapture. That would be unthinkable. But he is mistaken when he says, chapter 4, verse 1, is the rapture. The first time I heard that, as I said, I was in college chapel. A preacher from Canada was preaching, and he read Revelation 4, 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And the preacher went, right there, that's the rapture. And I went, huh? That's not the rapture. I'm thinking, I didn't say that out loud in College Chapel, but I'm thinking, that's not the rapture. But this is what has been preached and taught. Again, it came from Plymouth Brethren, from John Nelson Darby, from C.I. Schofield. C.I. Schofield's notes influenced much, uh, most Southern Baptist preachers through Dallas Theological Seminary, and independent Baptists came out of Southern Baptists, and that's where the history of this teaching comes from. So how could that many people be wrong that many years? Because, again, of the influence of the Schofield Reference Bible, which I've preached against over and over and over again. And we'll continue to do so. Continue to preach against the corrupt notes in the Schofield Reference Bible. Uh, well, uh, let's go to 1 Thessalonians. This is the classic rapture passage. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 this passage is what we would call the rapture passage, right? This is the classic one. There's not one group I've ever read that disagrees that this is, this is the rapture. Everyone who believes there's some kind of rapture believes this is a rapture, okay? 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So again, he's speaking of those, he's not speaking of those in the church service who ate too much lunch and are, are nodding off, okay? He's, he's talking about those who are dead in Christ, 
But their bodies, there's a metaphor of them sleeping. They're not asleep. They're with the Lord, but their bodies are asleep. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant about them. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the, what is it called? The what? The coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, that's where the rapture comes from, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Acts 1, 7 through 11, he said he's going to heaven. He's going to come again in like manner. How did he go to heaven? It was visible. He was received up into the clouds. In Revelation 1, 4 through 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, he says, We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Let's go to Matthew 24. Let's just see if we can find any, you know, any semblance of uh, any similarities in any of these passages here. Matthew 24, look at verse 29. Now again, folks who don't want this to be about the rapture, they'll, they'll bring up all kinds of false teaching, say, oh, well, this chapter is not for us, it's for the Jews. Again, Mark 13, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, it's for all of us. Um, who are the elect? We looked at that last week prove that over and over. The elect are believers. So this is absolutely talking about the rapture. By the way, they, they want to pick and choose. If you go to someone who believes that we're going to be taken out before there's tribulation, you ask them, uh, what if I told you that I know exactly the day, I know exactly the hour when Jesus is coming, I can tell you that. Oh, no, you can't. You're right, I can't. And you can't tell me either. And when somebody starts setting dates, they're really in error. It's, it's a mistake to do that. Um, well, why, how come? How come I can't tell you the day or the hour? Well, because God's word says of the day and hour, of that day and hour knoweth no man. Amen. I agree with you. Well, we use the word that day. It's a pronoun. It means there had to be an antecedent. You have to look before to see what day we're talking about, right? If you just walk up to somebody and say, hey, you remember that day? I mean, you just walk up to them. The first thing you say, hey, you remember that day? Uh, what day? What, what are you talking about? See, when we say that day, we were talking about some day before that, right? Okay, so we go to Matthew 24. What day of that day and hour knoweth no man? Well, it's over and over and over in this chapter. It's the coming of the Lord, or what we've called the rapture. But let's look at the characteristics of this. Look at Matthew 24, verse 29. And by the way, notice when it happens. Verse 29. Immediately, what are the next three words? What? After the tribulation, after the persecution, affliction, tribulation of those days. What, what kind of tribulation is it going to be? The Bible says it's going to be great tribulation, such as the world has never seen. Great trouble, great persecution, more widespread. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. This is a signature event. You can find that over and over and over throughout the passages of Scripture about Christ's coming uh, of that day and hour. It says, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see. It's visible. The Son of Man coming in the what? In the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. Who are the elect? Every saved person from every nation. They gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So far in Acts 1 and Revelation 1 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and Matthew 24, Christ's coming is visible. It's in the clouds. Have you seen that in every single one of these passages so far? All right, go to Mark 13. Here's a parallel passage, Mark 13, verse 24. Mark 13, verse 24. Mark 13, 24 says, But in those days... Verse 24, what are the next three words? What? After that tribulation. 
Folks, this, this is so clear in Scripture. And again, what people, the only thing that confuses people is they're taking some man with a bunch of letters after his name, they're taking his word over, man, over God's word. All right? God's word's really clear. Notice, in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, in the clouds, notice that, with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect. Who are the elect? Tell me again. Who are they? Saved of every nation. Gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth, to the uttermost part of heaven. What do you see here in the coming of the Lord described here? It's visible. He's coming with clouds. All right. Uh, let's go to Luke 21. Luke 21. Look at verse 25. And this is why I'm saying prophecy need not be difficult. Uh, let's, if you just simply believe what the Bible says, it falls in place. It really does. Look at Luke 21, verse 25. The Bible says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. What is coming on the earth? God's wrath is coming on the earth. He's going to be pouring out his wrath. The seven trumpets, God's declaring war against the world. The seven vials, he's going to be pouring out his wrath upon this earth. Notice verse uh, 26, their hearts are failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, verse 27, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. How many of you ever sung a song about your redemption draweth nigh? What are you talking about when you sing that? What, what are you talking about when you sing that? You're talking about the rapture. You're talking about when Christ takes you up in the clouds and you get a new body, amen? When you are made in the image of Christ, when you're like Him, you're going to see Him, you're going to be like Him, you'll see Him as He is. I just want us to see the characteristics are the same throughout. It's visible. He's coming in the clouds. So let's go back to Revelation. Is the rapture in Revelation? It is, but it's not in Revelation 4.1. And again, the reason that's important is because of the false teaching about pre-tribulation rapture. And I won't get into so much of the false teaching tonight. I simply want us to look at where is the rapture in Revelation. And I'm going to throw one out there that some uh, maybe haven't studied before and it'll give you something to dig into a little bit more. Uh, but look at Revelation 6. I believe there are at least three, at least three places in Revelation where the rapture is mentioned. Now let me say this. There are those who teach that Revelation is written in chronological order all the way from Revelation 1 all the way through 22. That is an error, okay? Then there are those who teach that it is written, it is two uh, sets of chronological order. So Revelation 1 through 11, 12 through 22, that is closer to the truth, but it is yet not complete, is not yet complete truth. Um, when we're studying Genesis 1, we, how many of you are in here in Sunday school, Genesis 1? We've been studying through the six days of creation, went day one all the way through day six. The, Genesis is not written in chronological order completely. Genesis Chapter 1, God gives an overview. He shows us creation, days 1 through 6. But then when you get to Genesis 2, chronologically, technically, Genesis 2, it goes back in time a little bit. Because what Genesis 2 does is instead of having a broad view, a broad survey of God's creation, it focuses down on the details of man's creation. And we'll see that as we get further into Genesis chapter 2. The point is it's not in perfect chronological order. The same is true with Revelation. Revelation, it, the, the events are repeated at least twice, but there are multiple times what, there are what are called parenthetical passages. And here's all that means. How many of you know what a parenthesis is? A parenthesis means it's an interruption in the thought. It means it's going to focus in a little bit on another part of that story. There are parentheses in Revelation. There are stories where God tells the order chronologically, but then he'll come back to part of that story and focus in on it even more. We'll, we'll see that as we get further into Revelation. But let me show you some examples here of where the rapture is in Revelation. Look at Revelation 6, verse number 9. 
And by the way, for those who say the church never appears on the earth after Revelation 4.1, what do you have to say about these verses? Folks, these, this is the church. Look at Revelation 6, verse 9. It says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. You say, yeah, but they're already slain. They're already in heaven. Okay, but let's continue on. Verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren. Hold on. We're talking to believers, and now we're talking about their fellow servants and their brethren. Are those believers? Somebody tell me, yes or no. They're believers. Are the, is that the church? Is that the church? How many churches are there, folks? There's, look, I know there are local churches. There is, let, let me teach this for a minute. There is not a universal church right now. That's Catholic doctrine. Hey, we're all one universal church. No, there are local churches, but there is a day coming when the entire church will be assembled. Where will the entire church be assembled? In heaven. The Bible makes that clear. Now, so that being said, are these people part of the church? The people who are still on the earth who have not yet been slain. Yes, they are. Notice what he says. Verse, uh, verse 10, they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood and them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed, where are they at on the earth, as they were, should be fulfilled. So what do you have? You have the same order we've seen in Matthew and Mark and Luke. You have great tribulation. You have great persecution of God's people. And what happens next? This signature event, verse 12. And I beheld when he'd opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll. We sing that, don't we? When we sing it as well with my soul. The heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men. And every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath. Wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? We've been murdering and martyring God's children, and now he's coming to declare war upon us. Woe be unto us, and yes, woe be unto them. You read very, the very next chapter, Revelation 7, right after the heaven departs as a scroll, right after they see the Lamb. What do you see in heaven now? Revelation 7, verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no Man could number. Some people say, oh, these are, these are just some Jews that are saved during these seven years' tribulation. Well, first of all, it says they're from every kindred. First of all. Secondly, it says that it's a number no man can number. Notice, after this I beheld, lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne. Where is that throne? In heaven. And before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. So you have God's wrath about to be poured out. And then you have a great multitude in heaven from all kindreds, nations, and tongues. How did they get there? Folks, I'll tell you how they got there. First Thessalonians 4, they're raptured, they're caught up. There's a resurrection. Now notice what he says next. Verse uh, 14, and I said unto him, uh, verse 13, One of the elders answered, saying to me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. There are those who say, well, that, see, that means they missed it. No, what it's saying is they were in it, and God took them out. 
Notice, keep reading. He says, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Folks, these are people who are in great tribulation, and they have been taken out. This is the rapture of the church. Uh, Go to another place. Look at Revelation 14. Revelation 14. When you get to Revelation 12, the chronology does start over again. And if you get to Revelation 14, in verses 9 through 16, you can find the earmarks. You find tribulation, people being persecuted for Christ. Verse 9, uh, the Bible says, If any man worship the beast in his image... And receive his mark, 14.9, in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Who are these people who are going to be dying in the Lord? People going through great tribulation. People being murdered and martyred. Notice, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. What happens right after great tribulation? The rapture of the church. God, Jesus Christ coming in the air. Verse 14, and I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Somebody tell me, who's the Son of Man? Who is that? Jesus. Having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Why does he have a sickle? Because there's a harvest. What is the harvest? His people, his children. The wheat is going to be gathered into his barn. Verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. This is the rapture of the church. This is God, Jesus Christ, bringing his people out. What immediately follows this? The same thing that immediately follows in Matthew 24 and in Luke and in Mark. What immediately follows? God pouring out his wrath upon the earth. Notice the very next verse of 17. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire. And cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle. And gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. What do these these grapes represent? Verse 19. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the, what's the next word? Of the what? Wrath of God. So this is the same order. What's the order? There's going to be great tribulation, folks. The church, God's people from around the world are going to go through great tribulation. When the Antichrist comes to power, we will go through tribulation. What will happen? Jesus Christ will come visibly. He will come in the clouds. All the kings of the earth, all the people of the earth who are not saved will mourn and wail and weep because of him. And we will be caught out. And immediately following the rapture of the church, what happens? The same day, what happens? The wrath of God is poured out. This order is over and over. It's consistent every time. Look for this order. It is there over and over and over throughout the Bible. I want to show you one more place that I believe is also the rapture of the church, Christ's coming for his own. Uh, Go to Revelation 18. And this is where, again, I do not believe that uh, Revelation 12 through 22 are just purely chronological. I believe that God gives us some chronology, but then he focuses in on some specific stories within Revelation, for example, the fall of Babylon. If you go to Revelation, I won't say a lot about this tonight, I'll just show it to us briefly. Revelation 18, and we will get to a place, we'll go verse by verse through Revelation. But look at Revelation 18, verse 4. Speaking of the fall of Babylon, and if you read right before, in verse 2, it says, Babylon is fallen. Say, who is Babylon? We'll get to that another night. Verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her. Out of whom? Out of Babylon, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, 
and that ye receive not of her plagues. Verse 4, I absolutely believe, is another instance of the rapture of the church, and I'll spend more time on that when we get to Revelation 18. If you go to Revelation 18.20, it says, Rejoice over her, Babylon, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. I believe this chapter is parenthetical. It's a parenthesis. It's God focusing in on another story uh, in the timeline. Look at verse uh, 24. In her, in Babylon, was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain through tribulation, through great tribulation, upon the earth. What I want us to see again, this statement this man made, he's a good man, he, great preaching on family, great preaching on soul winning, but just buying into uh, the Schofield notes when it comes to Revelation 4, he said, if Revelation 4.1 is not the rapture, then it never appears in the book of Revelation. Well, folks, those three places, I absolutely believe all three of those are the rapture of the church. Let's go back to Revelation 4 very quickly. Why, why is this not the rapture? Number one, let's look at this, because only one person is being spoken to here, Revelation 4.1. Who is it? It's John. Just John is being spoken to. You know, the Bible says the day is coming, we're going to hear the voice of the Son of God. Now, not just John, I am too. And so are you. He's going to call your name. You're a child of God. You will be spoken to. Well, in this passage, only John is being spoken to. Number two, people say, yeah, but there's a voice. It's like a trumpet. Isn't there a trumpet with the coming of the Lord, with the rapture? There is. But what is the point? Why is he saying there's a voice like a trumpet? Well, if you go to Isaiah 58, verse 1. In fact, let's just turn there. Uh, Isaiah 58, 1 also has a voice like a trumpet. Does that mean it's a rapture? No. The point of it being a voice like a trumpet is that it's a loud voice. Uh, some people come to a church like ours, they're not used to loud preaching. They're used to a preacher getting up, and sometimes I'll talk quietly. They're used to a preacher getting up or sitting on a stool or this unbuttoned shirt and his, you know, and, and his skinny jeans and, and just having a talk with you. I just want to talk with you today. You know, I mean, I don't want to offend you. I don't want to tell you anything that's going to make you upset or anything. You know what? When you hear real preaching, you may not like what's being said, but when you leave, you know exactly what's been said. When you leave, you've, you're made, you've made a decision. Isaiah 58.1, by the way, that's the difference between teaching and preaching. All good teaching has some preaching in it. All good preaching has some teaching in it. Teaching informs you. Preaching demands a decision. Preaching confronts you and says, what are you going to do about it? Isaiah 58.1, God told Isaiah, when you preach, he said, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. What does he mean? Get loud, Isaiah. You know, God told Ezekiel, when you preach, he said, clap your hands, stomp with your foot, howl, oh, he said, when you preach, you get some people's attention. Look, why? Because you're going to make a decision. It's going to get your attention. You're going to walk away. You may not like what's said, but you're going to know what's said, and you're going to make a decision about what's said. What is he talking about? There's a voice like a trumpet. It's a loud voice. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sins. Revelation 4, he heard a voice like a trumpet. Does that mean it's the coming of the Lord? No, it was a loud voice like a trumpet. Number three, I want you to see this. He has shown things which must be Hereafter, This is not the rapture. This is things that are coming hereafter. In Isaiah 6, God, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. He was shown things that were coming hereafter. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul was shown things which were going to be hereafter. In fact, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12. Look at this for a minute. Uh, I believe this is when Paul was stoned. You may remember he's been stoned and beaten and shipwrecked. And uh, I think one of the times, I really do, I believe he was dead and God gave him his life back. If you look at 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1, Paul writes, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. I was either in the body or I was out of the body. I don't know which one, Paul's saying. I was either dead or alive, I don't know. But nonetheless, I saw these visions. I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. Is this the rapture? No, it's simply God is bringing Paul up, showing him some revelation, some things to come. He's showing him things to pen down. Verse 3, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not 
lawful for a man to utter. So number one, only one person's being spoken to here. That's John. Number two, the voice is like a trumpet. That just means it's loud. Number three, he's shown things which must be hereafter. Number four, John, if you go back to Revelation 4.1, he is in the Spirit. He's in the Spirit. Look at Revelation 4 again. Revelation 4, verse 1. After this I looked, behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice... Uh, which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was what? What does it say? I was in the Spirit. Go to Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8. Folks, can I ask you, when Jesus comes again at the rapture, is it just our spirit? No, listen, when you die, if you, th those who've already died in Christ, they're already with the Lord. Their body's here in the dust, but they're absent from the body and present with the Lord. No, what's the beauty of the resurrection? The beauty of the, of the rapture is that our bodies as well are going to be resurrected. It's a physical resurrection. We're going to be made like Jesus Christ with incorruptible bodies. But now look at Ezekiel 8. Here's another example. Ezekiel is not physically being taken up. He's being taken up in the spirit. Ezekiel 8, verse 1, it says, Came to pass in the sixth year, the sixth month, the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me. So he's physically sitting in his house. That the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness is the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of an hand, and he took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. Now look at Ezekiel 11.24. 11.24. It says, afterward, the Spirit took me up. Where is his body? It's still in his house. Afterward, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea. So he's not physically being taken to Chaldea. He's being taken up in the Spirit in a vision to Chaldea. John is not physically leaving the Isle of Patmos and going to heaven. He is being taken up in the Spirit to see things that are coming. Folks, when the rapture happens, let's go back and look at it. Is it just a spiritual thing, or do our bodies literally rise? Our bodies literally rise. In fact, let's turn to this other passage. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. And this was the argument in 1 Corinthians 15. Well, there's no resurrection. Paul said, well, if there's no resurrection, then your faith is in vain. You have no gospel. And that's what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, what I've preached to you is you've believed in vain if you don't believe a resurrection. If you just believe that Jesus died on the cross and was buried and that's it, you have no hope. Uh, think, of, think of just water baptism for a minute. That's a picture, right? It's a picture of salvation. Imagine if we did water baptism with no resurrection. Okay? I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> we only lost a few this way, you know. No, look, look what, what's the beauty in that? Of course not. No, there's a resurrection. You're buried and you come out of the grave. That's the picture. That's the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. And it's not just a spiritual thing. Our bodies are going to be resurrected. And the Bible says, made like unto his glorious body. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption, this body, inherit incorruption. And neither, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed. The Bible says in 1 John, we shall be like him. We'll see him as he is. Verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Hallelujah. And this mortal must put on immortality. Revelation 4 is not the rapture. John is not physically being taken up to heaven. He is in the spirit. Folks, when the rapture happens, the coming of the Lord we are, our bodies literally are going to come out of that ground. The Bible says uh, that, that to be absent from the body is present with the Lord, but he's going to raise our bodies. I'm so thankful when I have a funeral for a saint of God, a child of God, that I can say, folks, this is not a final resting place. This is resurrection ground. That's exactly what it is. Number five, Revelation 4, is it the rapture? No, it's not. Jesus is not 
coming in the clouds here. We've seen all these examples in the Bible that he's coming visibly. He's coming in the clouds. Is Jesus coming in the clouds in Revelation 4.1? He is not. As a matter of fact, if you read the next passages, he is standing near the throne of God, getting ready to open the book to reveal to us the things that are coming in the future. So is Revelation 4.1 the rapture, the coming of the Lord? No, it is not. Why does it matter? It matters because there are plenty of clear scriptures showing the coming of the Lord, and truth matters. And when you take Revelation 4.1 and teach that it is the rapture of the church, you cause all kinds of other errors when it comes to the timing of the coming of the Lord. Truth matters. It does. Lay aside your prophecy books. Get out the book. I, I want to read some of those books. That's fine. First, get really familiar. Really familiar with this book. You know, if you get really familiar with this book, I say to every preacher, anyone who wants to preach or teach, you get really familiar with this book. You know why? Because then if you pick up another book, you may be able to eat around the bones. You might be able to glean some things. You, you know how uh, bank tellers are trained uh, to, to recognize counterfeit bills? You know how they are? They don't study the counterfeit bills. You know what they do? They handle the real thing. Over and over and over and over and over. And then suddenly... Something doesn't feel right. Something doesn't look right. You know what? You handle this, the real thing, over and over and over and over and over. And then you read something else and you go, that doesn't seem right. You know why? Because you know the truth. You know the word of God. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you. You've told us things to come. We can trust your word. And uh, thank you, Jesus. You are coming again. Now, you said we'll face tribulation. You said in the world we'll, we shall have tribulation. But to be of good cheer, you've overcome the world. You said in the world we'd have tribulation, but in you we'll have peace. So, Lord, help us to understand that, to believe that, to arm ourselves with that mind, and to go out into the world this week and be a witness for you. Help us not to hide in a corner. Help us to uh, let our light shine brightly this week. Bless us as we go our separate ways. We love you. In Jesus' name.